Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So today we're going to be looking at the Beatles' second phase, and uh, this is a result of reading this book, Four Sides of the Circle, by Terry Wilson, The Beatles' Second Phase, 1970 to 1974. Great book, and um, I'm going to try and explain to you what it's all about. So this is a concept which um, I think I knew about subliminally, but I maybe hadn't quite crystallised it, and I think maybe the same is true for other Beatles fans, music fans, so I thought this would be quite a useful video to do. So essentially the idea is that when the Beatles broke up in 1970, John Lennon had announced in secret that he was leaving the band, of course, the previous September. McCartney announced uh, that he was leaving, really, in um, April 1970. When that happened, there was a huge... There was the perception of a huge schism in the Beatles world, which of course was true uh, to a large extent. The Beatles had broken up. Uh, only time would reveal that that was a permanent split. But um, contractually, all four members of the band were still tied together via the tortuous twists and turns of the of the Apple contract and the EMI deal. Three quarters of them were represented by Alan Klein at this point. Um, John, George and Ringo. Paul had um, rejected Klein's managerial services and uh, that was part of the reason why the Beatles broke up, of course. But... Um, you know, the idea is that all four Beatles were still tied together legally, if not creatively. And um, what happened really for the next four years was that um, under the terms of the contract, any time any of them released any music, brought out an album or a single, uh, that had to go through the twists and turns of the Apple um, legal scheme. And all four Beatles had to sign off on every release. And um, as far as I know, all four Beatles as well, um, were able to capitalise financially whenever any of their former colleagues released a record. So they were tied together in all kinds of ways. But also, at least um, three quarters of them, well in fact all four of them, carried on working together in different shapes and forms and configurations over the next few years. John Lennon finally brought the curtain down legally on the Beatles in December of 1974 when he finally signed the agreement saying that the the legal partnership was going to be dissolved, but between 1970 and 74, there was an awful lot going on in the studio, different members of the band playing on each other's releases. It was mainly, it was mainly John, George and Ringo doing that because of the, the way that the cards had split really, with McCartney on one side and those three on the other side. McCartney was largely operating on his own really, um, starting his solo career with the McCartney album in uh, April of 1970, and then of course he went on to, to form Wings. Um, the other three Beatles, George, uh, John and Ringo, carried on working together, and we'll see that in a moment, how that all transpired. But then there was one big album where all four Beatles sort of came together finally, but uh, not all at the same time. So I'm going to run you through ten key releases from this period which hopefully will illustrate um, what I'm talking about. So um, let's make a start. So the first the first record really to talk about is Ringo, Ringo Starr, Sentimental Journey, which is the first solo album really by a solo Beatle, uh, recorded between October of 69 and March 1970. So it really does straddle those months where the Beatles were falling apart. They were still in existence when Ringo started to record the record. Well, just about. John had announced he was leaving, but they still had some sessions uh, still to do. Completed in March 1970 and released on the 27th of March 1970. And this was his album of standards, really, which he recorded uh, to please his mother, I think. But on this record, um, George Martin handles um, the production duties. Each of the tracks on the record was produced by a different arranger. He had quite, he had some quite famous arrangers on here. Um, everybody from um, Oliver Nelson, Quincy Jones, Johnny Dankworth, Paul McCartney, all kinds of people. Um, McCartney arranges the song Stardust, really nice arrangement of that. So. Uh, that's a nice example already of uh, of Paul, Ringo and George Martin working together on a Ringo album. But this was really before any of the spectacular fireworks erupted, you know, in terms of the Beatles breaking up. So then we skip to um, the 17th of April 1970, which was um, really the kind of line in the sand, really. This is Paul McCartney, his 
debut solo album, McCartney, which he'd recorded in secret between December 69 and February of 1970. A bit of glare there, sorry. Try again. <laughs> and, um, you know, this, this record has been covered in great detail by many people, uh, largely a collection of odds and ends with a couple of big tunes thrown in. You've got Every Night and Maybe I'm Amazed are the two big songs on this record. But um, McCartney, I think at the time, he was scraping around. He was, he was working on new ideas and making stuff up in his living room at um, Cavendish Avenue in London. But he was also drawing on a few odds and ends of songs that had been around since the Beatles' day. So on this record, you've got um, Hot As Sun, which is a song he'd, an instrumental song he'd written as a teenager, uh, which he'd been messing around with during the Get Back sessions. A little fragment of the song Suicide, uh, which was a kind of Frank Sinatra-esque song, which again had been demoed at the Get Back Sessions, along with Teddy Boy, which um, is one of the more complete songs on the record. The Beatles had tried to rehearse that a little bit uh, during the Get Back Sessions. Don't think John had been too keen on it. Uh, the great song Every Night, which had also been started during the Get Back Sessions. And um, but an even earlier song on this, actually, Junk, had been uh, demoed by Paul as part of the White Album demos, the, you know, the famous White Album sessions that had been done at Kinforns, George Harrison's bungalow. I think an attempt had been made. So, um, yeah, this is an interesting example, I suppose, of the fact that when you get into the Beatles solo years, some of the music that's being released is actually music which could have got onto Beatles records, and uh, there are some examples of that. So that record is it's kind of haunted by the ghost of the Beatles, really, and um, that's quite a nice one to listen to in the context of what we're talking about. Uh, OK, so uh, still staying in 1970 now, so 30th of November 1970, this is one of the big ones. We have George Harrison's monumental, epochal release, All Things Must Pass, triple uh, studio album, of course. And there's a few interesting connections with this as far as the Beatles are concerned. So Ringo, Ringo plays on a few tracks on this record. He's on Wah Wah, Isn't It a Pity, uh, the title track. And um, I suppose in terms of Beatles material, Wah Wah is a very loud and angry and aggressive song, which George, I think George composed that after a bad day in the studio at Twickenham having arguments with McCartney during the Get Back session, so that song is definitely was definitely written at the time um, that the Beatles were still in existence and was a reaction to what had been going on. Uh, also, the great song Run of the Mill, uh, um, it, I think that's really known as being a coded message to McCartney, really. The lyrics to that song reference some of what George was feeling about his relationship with Paul and what had been happening in the studio. Um, All Things Must Pass, um, the title track on which Ringo played, uh, had been, famously, had been rehearsed by the Beatles during the, I think it was the White Album sessions, but they'd never met, um, managed to come out with a workable version of it. John was not very keen on the song at all. Various uh, desultory versions had been worked up, none of which really uh, did the song justice. George finally managed to pull a rabbit out of the uh, sack using the famous Phil Spector production and that song was finally realised and um, other than that there's one little nice Beatles reference on this record the song Apple Scruffs which is uh, of course a reference to the groupies who used to congregate outside uh, EMI studios and outside various Beatles homes throughout the late 1960s so yeah all things must pass certainly found George trying to tie up some loose ends and trying to um, you know put a few coded references in here and there and you had the Ringo connection as well of course. Right so still in 1970 so um, this was the first proper John Lennon solo album if you don't count the experimental stuff that he'd been doing in the late 60s. This is the Plasticona band record of course and um, this one uh, really was John really trying to, I want to say clear the air exactly, trying to draw a line in the sand. It contains the great song uh, God, of course, uh, which contains the line Don't Believe in Beatles. So this was John really, you know, mentally and psychologically, emotionally trying to make a break and um, start his solo career. However, you've got Ringo Starr playing on lots of tracks on this record. He's on Mother, he's on I Found Out, Well, 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 Hold On, uh, um, Isolation, I think at least, I think there might be a couple of other tracks. 
produced by Phil Spector, as had been um, All Things Must Pass, which I guess is another Beatles reference, given uh, his involvement with uh, the Let It Be project. But certainly, you know, even though John was pulling away from the whole Beatles thing, interesting that he had Ringo on the record and was certainly singing about some issues which were uh, preying on his mind relating to his, uh, his former band. Right, so now another big one. So um, we're moving into 1971 now, released on the 17th of February 1971. This is um, Paul and Linda McCartney's album Ram, which was uh, a big album really for McCartney. He'd gone to New York in order to uh, try to do something a bit more ambitious than his first album using session musicians and uh, the result was, well at the time it was critically panned but in subsequent years obviously it's uh, it's now looked back on with immense fondness, often name checked as a, as a favourite um, solo album by Beatles fans. And there are three tracks on this really which have Beatles connections, you have the song Three Legs which um, is a little blues song but um, you know at the time there was lots of stuff going down between Paul and John. Um, not face to face, they were slagging each other off in the music papers and making uh, barbed comments about each other and uh, McCartney started doing it in song as well. Um, Three Legs has often been seen as a bit of a, a dig at the former Beatles really. Uh, I should just say on this record too you have the image of the copulating Beatles on the back which is um, has often been seen as Paul's uh, you know, rather sour visual depiction of uh, Beatles shafting each other. You know, this is the really starting the period where Paul had realised he was going to have to sue the other three guys because he wanted to get out of the Alan Klein contract. For whatever reason, they didn't want that to happen. There were tax issues and Paul realised he had to uh, take the others to court. So it was quite a dark period for him. So even though this album has got a kind of magical childlike quality, there's a bit of bitterness coming through in the lyrics and some confrontational stuff going on. And Three Legs is one of those songs, really. Too Many People as well, which is the opening track on the album, obviously contains some non too subtle uh, digs at what John and Yoko have been doing, some of the political posturing they've been doing, I think, in McCartney's eyes over in New York. And um, so that record, uh, so that song definitely had a bit of uh, a Beatles flavour to it. But I suppose the big Beatles y number on this album is um, Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, which was um, an attempt really at doing a bit of a Abbey Road medley type of thing, very Beatlesy in flavour, and McCartney took the major step of getting George Martin involved to do the orchestrations on that song, probably to give it a bit of a Beatlesy kind of feel, which is a strange decision looking back, you know, this was still the period where he was trying to, again, you know, draw that line in the sand and start something new. I think he was trying to invent a new musical language in a way, but, um, you know, it was interesting how he did get George Martin on board for that track, he obviously thought this is a song which um, which does have the potential to uh, you know be seen as a bit of a post Beatles classic because his first album had been slagged off really badly by the critics so maybe there was at least part of him wanting to do something on this record which you know reminded people of Abbey Road and reminded people of the good old days so uh, there we go Ram released on the 17th of February 1971 then you have the Imagine album John Lennon released on the 8th of October 1971 and this album again has got some Beatles stuff happening on it you've got the famous track How Do You Sleep which was John's non too subtle uh, dig at Paul McCartney uh, on which George Harrison played I think that did create a, a little bit of bad blood really Harrison was uh, present for many of the sessions from this record he plays guitar on Give Me Some Truth, How Do You Sleep, Crippled Inside and Oh My Love as well so um, yeah you've got two Beatles in the studio here once again and uh, John and George coming together to uh, have a pop at their old mate Macca on the Imagine album. Meanwhile, you've got McCartney now forming his own band, Wings. Their debut album came out in uh, December 1971. And, you know, on the surface, this record doesn't really have much to do with the Beatles at all. Uh, definitely McCartney starting out with a, a brave new venture and stepping out into the unknown. However, uh, this uh, this um, this album contains the great song Dear Friend on the end of side two, which was McCartney reaching out to John, I think, and you know trying to, in a way, 
try to patch things up a little bit or really asking John you know does this mean so much to you all, the, all this stuff that's been going on is it all that important aren't we still mates you know fundamentally um, so um, but yeah I think uh, I think wildlife really uh, was a huge step for Paul you know clearly forming a new band and trying to step out of the shadow of the Beatles doing that university tour shortly afterwards but um, even on this record he was still talking to John he was still addressing John so that was still something that, that was definitely um, still in play for him just a couple of things to mention just in passing uh, the Bangladesh single by George Harrison released on the 30th of July 71 had Ringo on drums and then you had Ringo's single Back Off Boogaloo released on the 17th of March 1972 that had George on guitar so uh, George and Ringo still Still working together. So just two more to look at. So from George, released on the 22nd of June 1973, Living in the Material World, his second solo studio album. And um, yeah, this one featured Ringo on drums. So he plays on Who Can See It, The Day the World Gets Round, The Lord Loves the One Who Loves the Lord. He's on the title track, he's on So Sad, and he's on Don't Let Me Wait Too Long as well. So. Once again, you have two out of the four working together and Ringo's inimitable drum rhythm is present and correct on uh, Living in the Material World. And I'm going to leave the final, I'm going to leave the biggest one till last. This is, this is the granddaddy of them all, really. Although I should just say, you know, after this day, this record came out on the 9th of November 1973, but this was not the end of the story. The book, the Terry Wilson book I showed at the start, goes up until, I think, the end of... July uh, of um, December 74 so there were some more releases after this which continued the theme but even after that as well even after the Beatles legal partnership was finally dissolved there were still there were still ways in which they were working together you know think of Paul and Ringo working together on the tug of war album and uh, you know various various things like that George Harrison was still recording old Beatles tunes or would-be Beatles tunes uh, in 1980 um, you know, so the story does not end here, but we'll we'll end with this um, record as far as this video is concerned. 9th of November, 1973, the Ringo album, and this is the one that's famously contained all four Beatles. They're not in the same studio at the same time as each other. So just to run through, you've got um, Your 16, which features uh, Paul McCartney on on mouth sax, um, the great song Photograph, which was a Ringo and George co-composition. Uh, big hit single, of course, uh, featured George on guitar. Uh, I'm the Greatest, uh, the opening track, written by John Lennon and featuring John on piano and George on guitar. Sunshine Life For Me, Sail Away Raymond, which was another Harrison song, again featuring George on guitar. You and Me Babe, which was co-written by George Harrison and the old Beatles roadie Mel Evans, featured George on guitar. And then finally the song Six O'Clock, written by Paul McCartney, featuring Paul on piano and backing vocals. It was a, it was a McCartney and McCartney song, actually. It was, it was Paul and Linda, and Linda is on backing vocals on that too. So, And that album was a big hit. And, um, you know, that really still is the closest the Beatles came to all, you know, being in the... Well, they were you know, working on the same project, but they were not quite all in the same place at the same time. So... Um, yeah, so there's one that springs to mind later on where you had three Beatles again working on a project that would have been on the George Harrison album somewhere in England where, um, this is after John had been killed of course, and you had Paul, uh, George and Ringo played on George's song um, all those years ago. And like I say, you know, there were various other instances, but um, I just thought I would, I would focus on that 1970 to 74 period, which is the period covered in this book. So again, if you want to know more about this and really get into the ins and outs, this is the book to read, Four Sides of the Circle, The Beatles' Second Phase, 1970 to 1974 by Terry Wolfson. So that's it. Hope you found the video useful and interesting, and I'll be back soon. Take care. Bye for now.